The Sonatas and Partitas are a collection of six individual works, uh, three sonatas, three partitas, and they alternate. So we start with a sonata in G minor, and then a partita in B minor. Then the second sonata, which is in A minor, the second partita in D minor, the third sonata in C major, and the third partita in E major. Now I mention all of those keys and everything because it really is important to the larger structure of this collection, and there's a narrative arc that is that is made um, over the course of these six works. I'll, I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. Um, so on the sonata side of things, we have these three sonatas that follow sort of a traditional and well-known um, violin, uh, violin sonata or instrumental sonata form, the sonata de chiesa form, which normally meant that there's four movements where the first movement would be a slow introductory type of movement and the second movement a fugue, and then a couple of dance movements at the end. Um, the partitas, or partias, Bach uses the terms interchangeably, um, follow a looser structure of more of a, a set of dances, and they're different in each of the partitas. So for instance, in the B minor partita, we have um, uh, a series of four dances, but each dance is followed by a double, and the double is um, a, sort of a variation that follows the same harmonic structure as the previous dance. And in the D minor partita, he has more of a traditional um, grouping of dances, an allemande, corrente, Sarabande, jig, and then, but then he has this monumental, huge chacona, um, which is very unusual and very groundbreaking work. Um, so I mentioned that there is a narrative arc to this set that starts in the most conservative and somber um, G minor sonata, and then arrives with this groundbreaking in the middle with this groundbreaking chacona. That's it's really it's about fifteen minutes long, and it's really quite a journey um, through the through the whole piece. And then the final sonata and partita each kind of move through happier keys um, to arrive at, at really a very joyous ending with the E major partita. Um, to give, well, really quite an oversimplified <laughs> version, but just to make my point, I'll play you just a few bars from the opening of the very first piece in the set. So the G minor sonata opens like this. <laughs> So you arrive at the third partita and the final piece in the set in E major. So you can see uh, I've skipped just so much, <laughs> but you do, it does kind of give you an idea of where you start and where you end, which is a really important part of this set of music. Um, we know that Bach ordered this collection carefully in this way because we have an incredible manuscript in his hand from 1720. Here's an example. We'll be seeing several images from this manuscript. Um, it, it's a lot of a lot of ink on the page, but actually this is a manuscript that's really very readable for the performer, and it's clearly intended to be a performance copy. This wasn't just like something he dashed off for himself, himself or the compositional copy. Um, the page turns are kind of worked out in a way that work for the performer, etc. And we understand that the date of 1720 is the date of the manuscript, but not the date of the composition. So in fact, it, the, the thought is that these were pieces that were probably composed over the, a few years leading up to 1720, not all at once. Um, in 1717, so just before this manuscript was made, Bach took up his position as the music director in Curtin at the court of Prince Leopold. Now this was an interesting time in Bach's musical life. He had a young prince. Prince Leopold was 25 years old. He had just finished his three years of grand tour through Europe. So he visited all the great cities for the purposes of art and culture. And now he was coming back to his own court. He was an accomplished violinist and harpsichordist and gamba player. And he often joined in with his court musicians, apparently, which was quite contrary to court etiquette. So he was a real music lover and, and supporter of his court musicians. Uh, he was a Calvinist, which meant that he did not require music for worship. So this, 
Bach's output from this time includes almost all of the instrumental chamber music that we now know, including the six Brandenburg concertos, the violin sonatas and partitas, the six cello solo suites, a solo flute suite, and the four orchestral suites. So it's a it's a huge um, output of of orchestral and chamber music from Bach during this time. It was the only time in his life that his job didn't center around the church calendar. Um, frustratingly, however, we don't actually have a lot of information about which pieces were, might have been played when, at what function, on what dates, and there were probably other pieces that didn't survive this time. Um, we do know that there was a small but very talented group of musicians hired at this court. So Prince Leopold had taken advantage of um, the dissolving of a prestigious court orchestra in Berlin, and he hired at least six musicians, I believe, away from this court orchestra that was being dissolved and had them come to his court. So Bach had a strong orchestra, he had freedom from the church calendar, and he had a supportive prince. And so this was really an unusual and um, a little bit idyllic time, um, especially in, term, in terms of instrumental compositions and for what we have now. Looking at this list of output, the Brandenburg concertos, the orchestral suites, the violin sonatas and partitas, it's kind of impossible for me to imagine life as a Baroque violinist or life in chapel music without those works. So it's really incredible that they were all composed probably during a six year period of 1717 to 23.